Hello everyone, this is Donna Ganey and you're watching KEI-TV 12, The Kingdom Hour. And I'm joined with Jenny Maher and um, she's a wonderful woman of God and she has a, a story for the body of Christ to share with you, to help you to overcome um, possibly your experiencing situations that she has gone through. And we hope, we want to encourage you today that there is a way, there is hope in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome Jenny Maher to the Kingdom Hour. All right, thank you, Dr. King. Thank you for having me on the show. Okay, well, I'm excited and happy to have you here because um, you're, you're my ideal guest um, in that you want to help uh, the body of Christ. You want to help to see them through circumstances that they may have that they may have been through or maybe that they're going through. And um, I'm so happy to have you here, uh, Jenny. Um, I know that you are an author and that um, you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself. So can you share with us now? Well, uh, I grew up with, uh, my mom was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. So it was me and my brother who was four years older and her bipolar disorder would cause her to have to go in hospitals and with nobody to take care of us, that would put us in always separate foster homes and in LA the foster homes were not very good they're usually abusive and so growing up with a bipolar mom it left us where we basically never knew when she was going to blow up or get upset so I always say it was kind of like walking on eggshells because you never knew when something was going to happen that either she got sick or she just get angry and yell and scream and throw things so it was a kind of uh, childhood that you don't really, uh, you're not comfortable living because there's no comfort, there's no companionship or anything. So it wasn't a happy childhood. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, um, in any type of form of um, abusive or um environment that is not uh, conducive, especially for a child, it can be detrimental. And it's like repetition of that. It, it wouldn't feel comfortable, especially if it's on a daily basis or a weekly basis, even a monthly basis. Um, so could you tell a little bit more to the audience about what it was like um, transferring from foster home to foster home? Because there are so many children that are going through that right now. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I thankfully I was only in foster homes for a short periods of time while she was stabilized. But a lot of the foster homes, they, especially in LA, mm -hmm. they were overcrowded, and so the parents they it wasn't the abuse by the parents; it was more abuse by the other foster kids, like being in being new person in the house or whatever, the oldest or the one who's been there the longest, kind of took control and you kind of had to live by, go by the way they wanted you to do things or you get beat up or, you know, at one, time, at one point I was sexually assaulted. So, and in the foster parents, you couldn't talk to them or really say anything to you. So you're kind of put in, a, in an environment where you had no support at all and there is, and you had no uh, grounds or to control of anything, you know, what you were doing, what you did, anything, and you were out of your own own environment. So you, we had our bag of clothes that we took and, you know, so we did have our own house. And it was just really, it was scary each time because we never knew where we were gonna go, what kind of place it was gonna be. And then you go to a new place, you had to go by their rules, you had to go by, you know, different people's things. And, you know, then you get used to it or you get used to the people, like a couple, couple of them, I kind of got used to the other kids, and I actually liked it better than my home, and then they sent me back home, so it was it kind of like catch-22, you don't like it, but then you get used to it, it ends up being better, but then they send you back to the environment, because my mom was better, and then in time, it got bad again, and she, you go back into a foster home, so it was really uncomfortable, not predictable childhood 
yeah. where you, know, you just kind of you're sitting or you know, a couple of times I was out front of my house playing and drove up a police car and I was like okay I gotta go it's gonna be going into a foster home again so it was mm. real uh you know not knowing what any, your daily day was gonna be like yeah yeah you know I I I can only imagine um what that would be like um and I'm sure that there's a lot of people out there that are not just imagining that they have experienced it um and they may be finding it difficult to come out of uh, such a, the, you know, the, the thoughts, the uh, over and re repetition, um, uh, the consistency of not, you know, of a cycle that you as a child have no control over and mm -hmm. you're going into, a, you know, a vicious cycle of, uh, of systems, of um homes of getting to know people from over and over again and getting acclimated in one place maybe you like it and having to change and be reconditioned to another environment but also one of the things that that children experience is that they're separated from siblings would you um care to talk about that part of it well I wasn't really close to my brother because my brother was abusive towards me. Mm -hmm. He was, like I said, four years older. So I was never, I mean, there was times that I would have wished he was there for me. So I had some family, but we, we were never, oh, one time I can remember, we were really never placed in the same foster home. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was scary being by myself, especially at a young age. Mm. But it kind of made me grow up fast, too, because I, I had to actually, you know, a lot of times I had to um, take care of my mom, you know, mm -hmm. make sure things she was calm down or something like that, because my brother would more get angry and take it out on me, and he started doing drugs and stuff. So I really had to learn to grow up fast to yeah. uh, mature. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's that's a serious story there. But let's let's talk about um, how because I know you're an author also too, and you wrote a book. It's called mm -hmm. "Never Give Up, Have Determination," and God gave me a better look. Let's talk about that part of it. Um, what what um, can you tell us about your book at this time? Well, it. I there's a lot to say in the book, I'm sure. but because because <laughs> it wasn't just there was it wasn't just my childhood, but it was because it's kind of hard to explain. But with my mom, she got angry a lot, and she would get angry at others for no reason, and, and she would get angry at me for things that I didn't know what I did wrong. So a lot of times. I was apologizing to people and I kind of like growing up I suffered from migraines I had nightmares I had ulcers I had mm -hmm. stomach problems just from the stress and everything and so I had no one that I was used to talking to about what was going on during my my life and I had no real close friends and no family so I basically held in everything that I was going through Wow. But myself and trying to make my mom happy by buying her things or stealing her things just to make her have ha happy days. But I wasn't getting the daily comfort that a child should have received. Mm -hmm. So holding all, all that in, I didn't know how to like, talk to a friend. Like a couple teachers wanted, knew something was going on, but I just couldn't go out, let out and say, you know, this is going on. I need to talk. I do just something. And I actually ended up being a cutter, hurting myself to get rid of all the emotional pain I was dealing with so that I had the physical pain. And so not, not knowing, not having that support and not knowing how to socialize or talk about how I felt really affected me as I got older. And at 18, uh, my mom on my, 18th birthday my mom kicked me out to live with 
a so-called friend, a girl that I played basketball with, but it, we weren't really close. So that there really affected me. And then she acted like it was no big deal. And she got, got upset that I didn't want to talk to her on the phone. So it was really that back and forth where she'd do something bad and then she'd act like, you know, oh, you know it doesn't matter. You're, you should be fine. It shouldn't bother you. So it was the most... It wasn't like allowed to get emotional. I wasn't supposed to cry and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, like just shut your emotions down. Right. And then she didn't think she did anything wrong by doing it. So the only way I was able to get out of the situation, because after graduation, I had nowhere to go. So yeah. that's why I joined the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping being in the Air Force, it'd be a new start. And I actually did pretty good. I mean, I made some friends. I was a medical lab tech, which I really loved. I loved being in the Air Force, but mm -hmm. I couldn't I couldn't run away from what I was dealing with emotionally inside. Mm -hmm. And um, it just was eating at me. And I still, because I didn't know how to talk to people and make friends and stuff like that, I kind of did my job, did what I had to do, but I didn't really... Um, bond with anyone and make close friends or anything so I was alone again and I started to get depressed and things so that's when they found I found out that I was bipolar and that I also had post-traumatic stress disorder from my childhood and I was eventually medically discharged from the Air Force. Okay okay so during all of this time when you were growing up and uh, but prior to 18 years old, did you ever have any treatment? No. No. Yeah. So going from foster home to foster home, um, the government facilities or systems, they never saw or thought that there should be any treatment going on. Well, they I was required at by a certain age. They did require me to go to a therapist, mm -hmm. but this was when I was like 12 or under. And all we did was play games. We, I mean, I, we didn't talk. So mm -hmm. it wasn't, there was, wasn't anything that, you know, I, I could divulge it, what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I kind of didn't want to because I didn't want to be living in a foster home. I wanted to be at home. Uh -huh. So I kind of was afraid to say exactly what was going on and how bad it was because even though it was bad, I didn't want to live with strangers or in a place that yeah. I wasn't familiar with. So did you have a grandmother or, or any other family? Um, I had uh, aunts and uncles from my dad's side. My dad died when I was three from a car accident. So all he had four sisters, and all, but all his side of his family lived in New York. Okay. So I couldn't, you know, go into a foster home over there or anything. Oh, okay, I see. I see. Well, um, I'm glad that you were able to discover that, um, you know, that there was something that existed in your life that, and, and obviously at some point you wanted to overcome. I, I remember reading in a part of your bio that you indicated that you were going through uh, religious systems. Would you like to care, you know, to talk about that? I wasn't going through religious systems. Okay, good. It was mm -hmm. now growing up, uh, my mom didn't want to know anything about God or have us follow any, any religion. And that was mostly because she w was raised in a Catholic church kind of school. Oh. And this was when it was really abusive. And so she, mm. she wasn't against God, but she didn't really want us involved and it wasn't really talked about mm -hmm. so but I do remember the footstep sayings about you know God walking next to Jesus walking next to us during during our easy times and then why and then the guy asked why there was only one set of footsteps during my most troubling times mm -hmm. and back then I never understood it now it's just like mm -hmm. that doesn't make any sense why there's only one set of footsteps but since I've learned about God and everything, it, it take, makes total sense to me now. But that just shows how, because and I didn't understand things like that because I didn't understand God. I didn't understand religion. I didn't understand much of anything. I believed 
there was a God, I just didn't believe in God. And I didn't blame God because I didn't know him to blame him. So it wasn't like, God, why are you putting through me all this? Or why are you doing this to me? Because I had no, I had no uh, relationship with God. So it wasn't, I still had an open mind, but, and I kind of wanted to, but I didn't know how to, and I didn't want to upset my mom. So it was kind of just left alone kind of thing. And so it was after I went, now I went through years of, I lived, I was able to own my own house, my, but my mom ended up staying with me because she was my only family. So I kind of clinged on to her, even though it was so hard, just because she was all I had. Mm-hmm. And so she actually lived with me for a long period of time, which was very hard. And um, after she ended up moving out, it was great, but it was still that feeling of alone. And I was going, I was being in and out of uh, mental hospitals and I was being medicated for the bipolar and, and and the depression, but it was, it's very hard to medicate bipolar disorder because it, there's different kinds of bipolar disorders. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so, and then there's also the therapy is I was still because I think because I was still in the environment with my mom that was affecting me that the therapy wasn't really helping. So during the whole time after the military and during I was still having just still hurting myself. I was still going through depressive episodes. I was still going in and out of mental hospitals. I mean, I was angry all the time and I was depressed and I was, you know, then I'd be hyper and wanting to do all this. So, I mean, I was all over the place and it wasn't until when I turned 36 in it that it was a big turning point where I finally was just was done and I was so tired and felt so alone and it hurt so much when I decided to take my life and that's when it was the huge turning point okay okay so uh, tell me what what brought about a change what made you see life differently I know you told me it was a huge turning point when you decided to take your life but what what made you decide that you wanted to keep your life what made you decide that um because you didn't have your family support there you didn't have uh, friends. You didn't have true relationships. Um, tell tell the audience what made you decide that you wanted to have a, a change to where I'm going to live. I'm going to um, uh, be successful in life. I'm going to change my life around, and I'm going to help others. What made you decide to do that? Well, it was after when I... Uh, when I attempted suicide, I had taken a lot of pills, and these were pills that would have killed a horse. Yeah. And when I woke up in, in the emergency room like three days later and re- realized I was alive, and even though when I when I woke when they woke woke me up, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move anything but my head, mm. and I. You know, they had thought that uh, the swelling, because there's swelling in my spine, they thought that it would go away. But just realizing that I was alive, mm-hmm. I knew that God had saved me for some reason. I mean, just because I was alive. Because, I mean, I knew about hell, and I knew that if you attempt suicide, you go to hell. And at that point, I really didn't care. That's how much I was hurting. But being saved, knowing that he saved me, I just felt that there that he saved me and there had to be a reason. And that I was going to, you know, do whatever I can to get strong. And it was just a, it was a continually growing from there. I mean, it wasn't like, okay, now I'm going to be totally religious and, you know, do all this and everything. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was a growing process. But at that moment when I woke up is when I knew and then it was after two weeks when they had done all these testings on me to see what was going on to cause my paralysis. Mm-hmm. And they told me that it was going to be permanent. Mm. And um, my mom was coming in 
in that hospital. She would stay for a while, but it was more me caring for her than her caring for me. And it was when the doctors had told me and I called her up on the phone and she, I was upset and she told me I could cry for one day and that was it. And you know, I cried that night and I would listen to the radio and I, I was in ICU and I would listen to the radio. And I, after that day, the doctors told me, I woke up to the song, Live Like You Were Dying. And to me, it was like a message God was telling me to, you know, that everything was going to be okay, you know, and that just, I had to, you know, that it's going to work out. I mean, it didn't, it didn't stop me. I still had a lot of, a lot of struggles to get the process of from then to where I am now. And I even, I mean, I still uh, had bouts of depression and anxiety. And I even had times where I had urges that I wanted to just push myself in front of a bus. But, you know, it's because it was still struggling with some of the situations I was put in. But I can, but I was able to continue to grow. and, And it was... Well, I like the fact that you, you're talking about, you know, that there there is a process um, and that there's growth and that you're still growing, it, it sounds like. And, oh, yeah. and that's what's important because you're being for real. Um, you're, you're exposing that even though that I, I went through all of this um, and the doctor said that I was not, that I was going to be paralyzed, um, you know, it's right now I can see that you're up, um, you're talking, uh, you're moving around, which is a miracle in itself. And it shows that God had a purpose for you to be here and that there's many um, people that are going to survive because you're sharing your story. Um, tell us a little bit about the process um, that you went through, that you experienced in God. Um, that help you to continue on. I know you talked about uh, listening to the song, but I'm sure he continued to reveal oh, yes. more during the process. Can you share about that? Yes. Well, like I said, I the first year to year and a half, which I was in a lot of therapy and going through a lot of issues with as far as the, I, I was in living in a nursing home, living in the hospital, and the treatment from the caregivers and the people was it was, a, it was a fight like every day fighting to get strong i mean I, people right now i mean i can move my arms around and everything so people think that i'm a paraplegic but i actually i fought so hard to get strong on my own that to get to where i am because they told me i'd only be able to be in a power chair and i'd be living in a hospital the rest of my life and i was just not going to listen to it and so I, it wasn't until when I was in the nursing home and I was afraid, I wanted to learn about God, but I was afraid to, to ask anyone because I'm 36 years old and, you know, you, you, I was embarrassed to ask somebody. I mean, I didn't know about any of the different books of the Bible. I didn't know about the different religions. I didn't know. I mean, I thought Noah's Ark was just two two animals going into an ark and, you know, I didn't know the real meaning behind it or anything. So I was kind of embarrassed to ask anyone about it, but it was when, you know, I continued to have an open mind, like when I was really struggling, I would like say to God, God, please help me, help me through this. And there'd be like little things that happened that I just felt that God was around helping me out. And, but it wasn't when one of the other, uh, other patients in the uh, nursing home actually invited me to go to the church that was in the hospital and so I went to it and when I went inside of it it was just like everyone just like came around me and just was patting me on the shoulder and they were just like so happy to saying that they were so happy to see me there and they were, and it just felt like the the uh, pastor was like talking specifically to me and it was like a place where I finally felt like I belonged. And so I was going to them and it was, it just, once it was like a big dark place just opened up and light came in. 
And so I finally felt like there was hope. And so I started, that's when I started reading the Bible a little bit. I still didn't really ask a lot of questions. And I still, I mean, I still had a multitude of ups and downs and things, but I believe that God was helping me out. But there, like I said, there's still a lot of troubles. And there is even times, I mean, I went from the Colorado VA to the Memphis VA just in my wheelchair with two backpacks because it was so bad. And I just, and I went and I ended up septic in the hospital all alone. And I still went on the plane by myself to, to try to get to a better place. And it was at that Memphis VA where there was a student rev, uh, chaplain that she actually would sit, come to my bed and just let me talk to her. And so I was finally talked to her like every day because I was, had to stay in bed because I was sick. And so I finally felt comfortable enough to ask her, you know, what are all these different names in this? What are these called? What is this? And she started answering the questions. And I'm like, what is the different religions? I don't even know what religion I want to follow. And so she was just like talking to me. And I'm like, okay. So then I started reading the Bible and I'd watch the Sunday, you know, a broadcast on, in, on Sundays and on TV. And I started learning more. But it's funny because... You know, I was trying to, at the time, get out of the hospital from being, I didn't want to live in the hospital. And there, I had the opportunity to get a, a house built through a grant from the VA. And I was trying to get that done, but the only problem is I was, I still had my house in Colorado and I couldn't get the loan because of my credit. And I was like saying, I was trying to bargain with God. I was like, God, if you get me this loan, I'll go to church every day and everything. And, you know, I know now you can't bargain with God. And so it didn't happen. And I thought my life was over, that there's there's no way, you know, nothing's going to get any, any better. And it ended up that just, like, I think a few weeks after that, I was able to be in, put in a medical foster program, which was like a step out from the hospital. And even though that, hosp that place was not a good place, but I started praying for the family every day. I, I, my, my, I started you know, getting, reading the Bible every day, praying and learning about it. And I talked, go to the chaplain and, and talk to her and just started learning more. And, and it felt like I was growing in forgiving, you know, the way this lady was treating us and the other clients in her house and just, you know, praying to God that, you know, he'd help us and everything. And it was actually, I was, even though I was faced with a hard situation and there, it actually made me stronger within myself so that I was able to handle it and actually be able to move into my own apartment. And so like, when I think back, it's like God, you know, gives, gives us these struggles that at the time we think, you know, why is he doing this to us? Why, you know, why are you upsetting us? Why are you giving us these hard problems? But it's like, without those steps, I would have never be where I am now. Mm -hmm. Like if I were living in that house that I wanted to bargain for, it wouldn't have been the right place for me. I wouldn't have been able to take care of myself. Nobody would have been able to be over there. And, you know, we don't know at the time what he's planning for us. And I, and like I know now, you know, I started going to church and I started going to Sunday school and I started studying the Bible more. And I just, I just wanted to flood in all this information, learn all about it and everything. And I, you know, would talk to, now I have, I mean, now my family is, my father is my father and the church are my brothers and sisters and it's like yeah I can, I can go and if something comes up I used to panic and be like oh my gosh what's gonna happen now no, nothing's gonna happen I'm gonna be in trouble you know if a caregiver doesn't it does cancel so I can't get put in bed or something and now it's just like no I'm not gonna I'm not gonna upset I know God is gonna take care of me mm -hmm. whichever way it's gonna do it and but you know I don't to sit back and let it happen. I still, you know, do what I can to do what I need, but I have faith that whatever, you know, comes up, there's a reason for it. I don't know what it is, but he does. And I have faith that he's going to take care of me and he's going to do what's right for me. And because of that, I mean, I have like a new surrounding about me. I don't get stressed. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see a therapist. I mean, medically, mentally I'm stable you know and I 
yeah, so I, um, I'm i living in my own house now in Virginia, and you know, I paint. Oh, wow. I've been given the gift to paint that I, I, I prayed. I used to draw all the time, but mm -hmm. I would not have my hands or fists, and so it's, I thought it wouldn't be able to, and I just wanted to try it. And now I've painted lots of paintings, and that oh. God has given me that gift. And so, I mean, he's... And the opportunity to write this book has, you know, opened up to a lot of, I mean, it was hard at first because I had to deal with a lot of things that I had kind of put behind me, but it kind of opened me up to deal with it and to express it. I mean, I had to, you know, stop writing for a little bit and kind of calm things down. And then, but writing it out and getting it out is it's kind of like journaling, but it's also a way that I, you know, could share with other people who are, in, in some of my same situations to know that that doesn't have to be the end of it, that there's still hope. So, What a wonderful story. Um, you've been watching the Kingdom Hour, and this is Reverend Donna Ganey, and uh, my guest is Jenny Maher, and she's been sharing a wonderful story and some very uh, nice insights on how she is, is still able to overcome. And I like the fact, um, Jenny, that um, you, you have grown to a point of trusting, trusting God. But we're all are still growing, growing and still striving to go higher um, in the things of God. But I, I like the fact that the Lord was teaching you that um, if you just trust me, and he's teaching you that uh, to the point that you have grown to, yes, I trust him. I, I can sit, sit somewhere and I know that he's going to hold me, that I don't have to wait for um, the chair to come. The chair is already there. And, and I like that. Um, and I also was very impressed with the fact that, you know, no, no matter just how you showed your hand, you were able to actually operate the computer <laughs> for this. I don't use any so adaptive I'm really equipment. I'm impressed with that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say, I don't use any adaptive equipment because a lot of therapists, they want to make things e easier for us by giving us straps and adaptive devices to hold things and open things and do things and eat, everything like that. And I told them, I, I think adaptive devices disable you more because it, for me, I, I told them, I said, I want to be able to go into a restaurant and be able to just order something and eat without telling them to go in my backpack, give me this brace or whatever and strap it on. So I figure out ways of holding things in different ways so that I don't have to use any adaptive devices. And even doing that, you know, figuring out ways to do it is like an adrenaline rush because I'm able to figure out something more that I can do on my own. And it's just, I mean, it's like weekly I find something else that I'm able to do by myself. and It's a continued just thankfulness. Good. I'm so happy. And I'm, I just want to be the one person to tell you that you do belong in the body of Christ. And you have many brothers and sisters, and we all love you. And um, I'm very thankful to have you as a guest um, to share your story. And um, I like the fact that you have written a book to help others. Um, they may be experiencing it or that just maybe want to learn on how they can help others that may be in the situation that you have been in and that you have transformed from through a process. And that book is Never Give Up How how determination and God gave me a better look, and it's by Jenny Meyer. My I have a website. Yeah, can you share your website on how they can gain access to your book and yes, it's, communicate with you? Maybe they want you to come out and speak to their their groups or uh, speak in an audience about um, to help others. Yes, but, definitely. It's the mind, body, and spirit dot net, and it has my contact number and my email address. So, if anyone wants to get in contact with me, to just or email me, just even if you just want to talk or write or something, that I'm open. So, it's for whatever reason, but it's called the mind, body, and spirit dot net. 
Okay, and is that and is spelled out M I N D B O D D B O D Y A N D S P I R I T dot net. Yeah, but that starts with the the mind, body, and spirit. Okay. okay. All right. Very good. So, um, you know, I'm glad, and I hope that people will go there and um, go to your website and make contact with you. And also um, read your book. And also, Jen, Jenny, um, if you had any final words to share with the body of Christ in this hour that would make a difference in their life, what would it be? That no matter what you're struggling with or what you're dealing with, it doesn't have to be the end that you can keep moving forward and if you reach out to somebody or if you uh, reach out to uh, God or whoever it is that you, you know, are comfortable with that, you know, they'll help and that just don't, don't give up and don't, you won't have to be alone. Amen. Amen. That is um, a true statement and it's for real body of Christ you're not alone Jesus Christ loves you he came and he died for you that you might know him as your Lord and Savior and also too, to know that he's there for you and there is a place for you and with him in eternal life and I want to talk to you to ask you to give yourself to him today and not only give yourself to him but learn of him um, Jenny made a very important um, discovery that reading his word, it taught her to trust. It, it taught her to grow in the things of God and uh, to be sustainable in this hour. And we all need it, no matter what your situation is. Um, if you're homeless, the Lord loves you. If you, if you are in the hospital, Right now, the Lord loves you. If you're at a home and you're thinking about this, there's no hope. There's no uh, turning around, whatever your situation is. Maybe you're about getting ready to lose your home um, and you're so afraid that you won't be able to make it. God is with you. He has a plan for you. He's going to make things work out just for you. Trust him and believe that he will do it. And he's there for you to help you through it all. And the Lord will send the right person at the right time. He will send the right word at the right time. You don't know how. We don't know how, when, and we don't know where. But he has his own way of doing things. Just commit to his plans for your life. Commit to the open door that he has for you. And accept the closed one. Because they're going to be closed doors because those are the best ones to accept. Those teach you the most. Don't close it. Oh, my God. <laughs> you got to have faith. So thank God and have faith that it's a right reason and the right purpose for it. But also, Amen. one thing that I know is very important is to be led by the Spirit of God. And if he says, don't go that path that you've been going all your life, Take a left turn, make a right turn instead, do it. And at the end, you will find that everything is going to be greater and better for you. So trust him. But I invite you to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, no matter where you are, no matter who you're with. Yesterday, I danced in the store because um, <laughs> I prayed with someone. And they called me and they said, I went and, and they told me there is nothing wrong with me, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> the, and the, the um, doctor's expectation was greater than the power of God. They thought the power of God prevailed. And Always. So I danced in the store and I rejoiced and people were watching me, but I didn't care because... I know that Jesus Christ is Lord, and um, 
you know, uh, the person just stopped where they were and they said, you know, I'm going, I'm rejoicing, I'm happy, but I'm going to spend some very private time with God and just really thank him today. I invite you to do that too. The Lord is good, he is gracious, he is most kind, he is merciful, he is compassionate, he is wonderful, he is majestic, he is everything you need. Bless his holy name. We thank you for watching the Keenum Hour. And um, you've been watching Reverend Dr. Donna Ganey with Jenny Maher, who has a wonderful story. If you came in on this part, I invite you to go to the beginning to get it all. <laughs> and go to her website, The Mind, Body, and Soul. Spirit. Mind, Body, and Spirit. Dot net. He, mind, body, and spirit dot net. And learn more about Jenny and her book there. And her book is Never Give Up, How Determination and God Gave Me a Better Look. And we all need a better look. And I just want to thank everyone throughout the world that is watching in our program. And may the God of great, the God who sits on the throne, who rules and reigns forevermore. May he empower and equip you for the days to come. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you. Amen.